Hello everyone. Today we'll study section 4.1 and 4.2. First of all, let me introduce sigma notation. This is the Greek letter sigma. This is the Greek letter sigma. A expression of this symbol is called sigma notation. In the sigma notation, i from m to n, here i represents the index. I represent the index. M represent initial I value. M and N they are both integers. They are both whole numbers. M represent initial I value. N represent the final I value. I represent all whole numbers from M to N, inclusive. I represent all integers from m to n, inclusive. For example, if, n, if m is 2, n is 5, then I represent integers 2, 3, 4, 5. I represent all integers from m to n. This expression ai here, that's the formula for each term. For example, if m is 2, a is 5, then i equal to 2, 3, 4, 5. We plug in each of 2, 3, 4, 5 into the formula ai. Plug in 2, 3, 4, 5 into ai. Then we can find a value for 2, 3, 4, 5. Then add them up. Add them up. That's the result for this expression. That's the answer for this expression. Next, let me show you some examples. It will make more sense to you. Evaluate each of the following expressions. First example, i from 1 to 5, 3i plus 2. If i is from 1 to 5, i represent all integers from 1 to 5. That means i could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. i could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to this formula here. Plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to this formula. If I plug in 1, I get 3 times 1 plus 2. If I plug in 2, I get 3 times 2 plus 2. If I plug in 3, I get 3 times 3 plus 2. If I plug in 4, I get 3 times 4 plus 2. If I plug in 5, I get 3 times 5 plus 2. So plugging i is from 1 to 5. So we're plugging 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for each i. And then adding up. 3 times 1 plus 2 is 5. 3 times 2 plus 2 is 8. 3 times 3 plus 2 is 11. 3 times 4 plus 2 is 14. 3 times 5 plus 2 is 17. And then adding up. 5 plus 8 is 13. 13 plus 11 is 24. 24 plus 14 is 38. 38 plus 17. It's 55. That's an answer for this sigma notation. Next. I from 3 to A. I square minus 2I. I is from 3 to A. I square minus 2I. So if I is from 3 to A, I represent all whole numbers from 3 to 8. So I, I will be 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If I plug in 3, I get 3 squared minus 2 times 3. If I plug in 4, I get 4 squared minus 2 times 4. If I plug in 5, I get 
phi square minus 2 times phi. If I plug in 6, I get 6 square minus 2 times 6. If I plug in 7, I get 7 square minus 2 times 7. If I plug in A, I get A square minus 2 times A. And then adding up. Let's compute each term first. For the first term, 3 square is 9. 9 minus 6 is 3. That's first term. Second term, 4 square is 16. 2 times 4 is A. 16 minus A is A. Next, 5 square is 25. 2 times 5 is 10. 25 minus 10 is 15. Next turn. 6 square is 36. 2 times 6 is 12. 36 take away 12 is 24. 7 square is 49. 2 times 7 is 14. 49 take away 14 is 35. Next, A square is 64. 2 times A is 16. 64 take away 16 is 48. And then add them up. 3 plus A is 11. 11 plus 15 is 26. 26 plus 24 is 50. 50 plus 35 is 85. 85 plus 48 is 133. That's an answer for this sigma notation. Next. I from negative 3 to 2. I cube plus I square. I from negative 3 to 2. I cube plus I square. So I represent all, all integers from negative 3 to 2. That means I, I could be I will be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. I represent all whole, all whole numbers from negative 3 to 2. Now let's plug in each of them. If I plug in negative 3, I get negative 3 cube plus negative 3 square. If I plug in negative 2, I get negative 2 cube plus negative 2 square. If I plug in negative 1, I get negative 1 cube plus negative 1 square. If I plug in 0, I get 0 cube plus 0 square. If I plug in 1, I get 1 cube plus 1 square. If I plug in 2, I get 2 cube plus 2 square. Then add it up. In the first term, negative 3 cube is negative 27. Negative 3 square is 9. Negative 27 plus 9 is negative 18. In the second term, negative 2 cube is negative a. Negative 2 square is 4. Negative a plus 4 is negative 4. Next term, negative 1 cube is negative 1. Negative 1 square is 1. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Next term, 0 cube plus 0 square is 0. Next term, 1 cube plus 1 square is 2. Next term, 2 cube is a, 2 square is 4, a plus 4 is 12. Then adding up, negative 18 plus negative 4 is negative 22. Negative 22 plus 2 is negative 20. Negative 20 plus 12 is negative a. That's an answer for this expression. Next example, rewrite each of the following expressions using sigma notation. First example, 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8. Let's observe each term first. Here, each term is a single, is a single number, and the numbers varies from 3 to 8. Here, we can use sigma notation i from 3 to 8, and the formula for each term is i. When i is 3, I get 3. When i is 4, I get 4. When i is 5, I get 5, and so on. When i is 8, I get 8. 
Next. 10 plus 12 plus 14 plus 16 plus 18 plus 20. How do we write this using simple notation? Let's observe each term first. Here, each term is an even number. 10 can be rewrite as 2 times 5. 12 can be rewrite as 2 times 6. 14 can be rewrite as 2 times 7. 16 can be rewrite as 2 times 8. 18 can be rewrite as 2 times 9. 20 can be rewrite as 2 times 10. If we, if we observe each term, we can see that number 2 stays the same. The second number varies from 5 to 10. So I can take i from 5 to 10. And the formula is 2i. When i is 5, I get 2 times 5, which is 10. When i is 6, I get 2 times 6, which is 12, and so on. When i is 10, I get 2 times 10, which is 20. Next. 4 plus 7 plus 10 plus 13 plus 16 plus 19. How do we write this expression using simple notation? Let's observe each term first. The difference between 4 and 7 is 3. Difference between 7 and 10 is 3. Difference between 10 and 13 is, is also 3. Let's call, let, let's call a arithmetic sequence. If the difference is the same, let's call arithmetic se arithmetic sequence. If the difference between each term is the same, let's call arithmetic sequence. Now, how do we find a formula here? First term is four. Second term, 7 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3. 10 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3 twice. 13 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3 three times. 16 can be re rewrite as 4 plus 3 four times. 19 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3 five times. So let's observe these terms. Here we can see that number 4 stays the same. 3 stays the same. The only difference is the number in any end. This is 3 times 1. 4 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3 times 0. This 4 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3 times 0. 4 plus 3 can be rewrite as 4 plus 3 times 1. So you can see that for each term here, 4 stays the same. 3 stays the same. The only difference is the last number. Last number varies from 0, 1, 2 to 5. Last number varies from 0 to 5. So the index i is from 0 to 5. And the formula is 4 plus 3i. When i is 0, I get 4 plus 3, three times 0. When i is 1, I get 4, times three, 4 plus 3 times 1. And when i is 5, I get 4 plus 3 times 5. Next. 3 plus 8 plus 15 plus 24 plus 35 plus 48. Let's observe each term first. Here, number 3, it looks like it's 4 minus 1. Number 8 looks like 9 minus 1. 15 is 16 minus 1. 24 is 25 minus 1. 35 is 36 minus 1. 48 is 49 minus 1. Do we see the pattern here? 4 is 2 square. 9 is 3 square, 16 is 4 square, that's 5 square, 6 square, 
is 7 squared. So that can be derived as 2 squared minus 1, 3 squared minus 1, 4 squared minus 1, 5 squared minus 1, 6 squared minus 1, and 7 squared minus 1. So here we can see that for each turn, minus 1 stays the same. Square stays the same. The only difference is the first number. First number varies from 2 to 7. So this can be rewrite as sigma i from 2 to 7. The formula is i squared minus 1. When i is 2, I get 2 squared minus 1, which is 3. When i is 3, I get 3 squared minus 1, which is 8. And the last term, when i is 7, I get 7 squared minus 1, which is 48. That's how we write this expression using sigma notation. Next. f of s1 plus f of s2 plus f of x3 plus f of x sub 10. How do we write this using sigma notation? Let's observe each term first. For each term here, letter f stays the same. Function f stays the same. x stays the same. The only difference is their index. Index varies from 1 to 10. So this can be rewritten as sigma i from 1 to 10. f of x sub i. f of x sub i. i is from 1 to 10. When i is 1, I get f of s1. When i is 2, I get f of s2. When i is 3, I get f of x3. And when i is 10, I get f of s10. So that's how we write this expression using sigma notation. Next. f of s1 plus twice f of x sub 2 plus 3 times f of x sub 3 plus, last term, 10 times f of x sub 10. How do we write this using simple notation? Observe each term here. We can see that function f stays the same. x stays the same. The index varies from 1 to 10. Also, the coefficient in the front, coefficient in the front also varies from 1 to 10. So, that's the sigma i from 1 to 10. Coefficient is i. Index is also i. So i times f of si. When i is 1, I get 1 times f of, f of 1, f of s1. When i is 2, I get 2 times f of s2, and so on. When i is 10, I get 10 times f of x sub 10. Next, let me show you some properties about sigma notation. First property, sigma i from 1 to n of a i plus b i equal to sigma i from 1 to n of a i plus sigma i from 1 to n of b i. Let's prove it. Sigma i from 1 to n of a i plus b i. If I expand this notation, if I expand this sigma notation, what do I have? I represent all whole numbers from 1 to n. So when i is 1, I get a1 plus b1. When i is 2, I get a2 plus b2. And similarly, when i is n, I get a n plus b n. So here, i varies from 1 to n. Next, let me open the parentheses. Group all a's together and group all b's together. If I group all, if I group all a's together, I get a1 plus a2 plus a n. If I group all b's together, I get b1 plus b2 plus b n. Then, 
rewrite each parenthesis using sigma notation. For the first parenthesis, we can see that for each term, a stays the same. Index varies from 1 to n. So I can write it as i from 1 to n ai. When i is 1, I get a1. When i is 2, I get a2. When i is n, I get an. So that's the first parenthesis using sigma notation. Next, we write the second parenthesis using sigma notation. What do I get? Let's observe the term here. For each term, b stays the same. The only difference is the index. Index varies from 1 to n. So take i from 1 to n of bi. When i is 1, I get b1. When i is 2, I get b2. And when i is n, I get bn. Therefore, sigma i from 1 to n of ai plus bi equal to sigma of ai plus sigma of bi. So, if there are two terms in the parentheses, I can rewrite this sigma notation into two sigma notations. That's the first property. Second property. Sigma i from i from 1 to n c times a i. Here c is a constant. When we have a constant times a i, I can always pull out a constant, like c times sigma i from 1 to n of a i. Let's prove it. Let's prove the second property. Sigma i from 1 to n of c times a i. Let's expand this sigma notation first. Let's expand this notation first. Here, i varies from 1 to n. When i is 1, I get c times a1. c times a sub 1. When i is 2, I get c times a sub 2. When i is n, I get c times a sub n. Then we can see that for each term, c is a common factor. For each term here, c is a common factor. I can pull out c. If I pull out c, I get a1 plus a2 plus an. Next, let's try to rewrite, it. Let's re try to rewrite what's in the parentheses using sigma notation. What's in the parentheses? Let's observe the term here. For each term here, a stays the same. The only difference is the index. Index varies from 1 to n. So I can write, write, it as, write it using sigma notation i from 1 to n, a sub i. When i is 1, I get a1. When i is 2, I get a2. When i is n, I get an. So that's a proof for the second property. Next, let me show you more formulas about sigma notation. How do we find the sum for this, for this expression? i from 1 to n of 1. So here, i varies from 1 to n. That means i will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n. The formula is always 1. So when i is 1, I get 1. When i is 2, the formula is also 1. When i is 3, the formula is still 1. And when i is n, the formula is still 1. So here, i from 1, 2, 3, up to n, there are n terms. If 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, n times, I get n. So the sum i from 1 to n of 1 equal to n. That's the first formula. Next i from 1 to n of i. How do we find the sum? i from 1 to n of i. So here, i varies from 1 to n. When i is 1, I get 1. When i is 2, I get 2. When i is 3, I get 3. And when i is n, I get n. How do we find the sum here? Think of this way. Let s equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus, da, 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 plus n. Then let me add another s. For another s, I write it backward. 
if I write it backward, the last term is n. The second last term is n minus 1. And the third last term is n minus 2. Da, 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 da. If I write it backward, the last term is 1. If I add a left side, if I add a left side and a right side, what do I get? On the left side, s plus s is 2s. On the right side, 1 plus n is n plus 1. 2 plus n minus 1. 2 plus n minus 1 is also n plus 1. Next term. 3 plus n minus 2. That's also n minus 1. Last term. n plus 1. That's also n plus 1. So if I add a term this way, every term is n plus 1. How many terms do we have here? How many terms do we have here? From 1, 2, 3 to n, there are n terms. So, if we have if we have n plus one n terms, their sum is n plus one times n. If we have n plus one n terms, we have n plus one times n. Then, we are looking for the sum one plus two plus three plus n. That means we are looking for s. In order to solve for x, I divide both sides by two. In order to solve for x, I divide both sides by two. So s equal to n plus one times n over 2. S is the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus n. So the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus n is n times n plus 1 over 2. That's the sum of i, i from 1 to n. Next. The sum i from 1 to n of i square. How do we find the sum of i square where i is from 1 to n? For this expression, when i is 1, I get 1 square. When i is 2, I get 2 square. When i is 3, I get 3 square. And eventually when i is n, I get n square. The way to find a formula for this expression is very hard. Here, I'll skip the proof, give you an answer directly. The answer is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. That's the sum. 1 square plus 2 square plus 3 square plus n square. Here, I'll skip the proof. Memorize the formula. Next, i from 1 to n of i cube. That equal to 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube plus n cube again here I'll skip the proof give you an answer directly the answer is n square times n, n plus 1 square over 4 that's the sum of 1 cube plus 2 cube plus 3 cube plus n cube n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. So, memorize these four formulas. Let me put everything here. i from 1 to n of 1 equal to n. i from 1 to n of i, the sum i from 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 over 2. i from 1 to n of i square is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. The sum i from 1 to n of i cube is n square times n plus 1 square over 4. Memorize these four formulas. Memorize these four formulas plus these two properties here, plus these two properties. Next, 
Next two some examples about using formulas of sigma notations. We write each of the following expressions without using sigma notation. First example, sigma i from 1 to n of 4i plus 3. First of all, if there are multiple terms, I can split it into two terms, two sigmas. Sigma i from 1 to n of 4i plus sigma i from 1 i from 1 to n of 3. That's the first property. If there are two, if there are two terms in the parentheses, I can split the sigma notation into two sigmas. That's the first property. That's the first property. Next. Here, index is i. That means we consider everything other than i is a constant. So I can pull out 4. In the first sigma, pull out 4. If I pull out 4, I get sigma i from 1 to n of i. Next, I, I pull out 3. If I pull out 3, I cannot leave a blank here. So I put 1 here. This 1 is a placeholder. That's the second property here. When there's a constant times a function, I can pull out a constant. When there's a constant times a function, I can pull out a constant. That's the second property of sigma notation. Then, I have 4 times sigma i from 1 to n of i, plus 3 times sigma i from 1 to n of 1. What's this? By the formula here, sigma i from 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 over 2. Sigma i from 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 over 2. So number 4 stays the same. This is n times n plus 1 over 2. For the second expression, I have, I have sigma i from 1 to n of 1. We know that sigma i from 1 to n of 1 is n. So here, number 3 stays the same. Sigma i from 1 to n of 1 is n. Then. Simplify the expression. 4 divided by 2 is 2. I get 2n times n plus 1 plus 3n. Then distribute 2n. I get 2n squared plus 2n plus 3n. Combine like terms, I get 2n squared plus 5n. That's how I simplify the answer. Next. Sigma i from 1 to n of 12i, 12i squared minus ai. So if there are multiple terms, I first of all split the sigma into two sigmas. I get i from 1 to n of 12i squared minus i from 1 to n of ai. That's the first property. Next. By the second property, I can pull out constant. If I pull out 12, I get 12 sigma i from 1 to n of i squared. In the second term, I can pull out a. If I pull out a, I get a times sigma i from 1 to n of i. Then, use the formula. i from 1 to n of i squared. i from 1 to n of i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Here, number 12 stays the same. I get n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6 minus a times sigma i from 1 to n of i. We know that sigma i from 1 to, 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 over 2. So leave number a the same. I get n times n plus 1 over 2. Then cancel 12. 12 divided by 6 is 2. I get 2n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. Here 8 divided by 2 is 4. Minus 4 times n plus 1. Then keep 2n the same. For you, I get 2n squared plus n plus 2n plus 1 minus 4n times n plus 1 
then distribute to n I get 4n cube plus 2n square plus 4n square plus 2n minus 4n square minus 4n then combine like terms I get 4n cube 4n square get cancel plus 2n square minus 2n next example sigma i from 1 to n of a i times i plus 1 here I can first of all distribute a i if I distribute a i I get a i square plus a i then if there are multiple terms I can split sigma i from 1 to n of a i square plus sigma i from 1 to n of a i then if there's a constant pull out constant if I pull out constant I get sigma i from 1 to n of i square plus a times sigma i from 1 to n of i then use a formula sigma i from 1 to n of n square that's n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6 next sigma i from 1 to n of i that's n times n plus 1 over 2 then simplify I have a divided by 6 is 4 over 3 n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 plus 4 times a divided by 2 is 4 4 times n plus 1 now here we try to eliminate denominator first. 4 is a common factor. I try to pull out 3. If I pull out 1 third, I have 4n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1. If I pull out 1 third, 4 divided by 1 third is 12. I get 12n, n plus 1. If I pull out 1 third from here, I get 4. If I pull out 1 third from here, number 4 is 12 over 3 number 4 is 12 over 3 if I pull out 1 third I get 12 here then simplify what we have here is 2n squared plus n plus 2n plus 1 plus 12n 12n times n plus 1 then distribute I get a n cube plus 4n square plus a n square plus 4n plus 12n square plus 12n then combine like terms I get a n cube 4 n square plus a n square plus 12 n square is 24 n square 4 n square 4 n plus 12 n is 16 n that's how we simplify this sigma notation next we will study area under the curve first of all let me introduce the notation let f of x be a continuous function of the closed interval from a to b. The expression integral from a to b, f of x dx, represents the area under the curve y equal to f of x and above the x-axis, area under the curve above x-axis, from a to b. It's red. This symbol is red. Integral of f of x with respect to x from a to b so this expression represents area under the curve above s above the s-axis 
from A to B. Note, if the curve of f of if the curve of y equal to f of x is above the x-axis, then the area is passive. If the curve is above the x-axis, then the area is passive. That's an area under the curve above the x-axis. However, if the curve of y equal to f of x is below the x-axis, if the curve is below the x-axis, then the area is negative. Because this area represents area under the curve above S S axis. But here this area is actually the opposite. It's below, it's above the curve, but below S axis. Therefore it's, this area is negative. It's an opposite. Passive area is the area under the curve above S S axis. But this area is an opposite. It's an area above the curve, below S axis. That's why this is a, this is negative area. So if a curve is above s-axis, the area is passive. If a curve is below s-axis, the area will be negative. Next, let's look at some examples about area under a curve. Suppose the graph of y to f of x is shown below. Suppose that's a graph y to f of x. Evaluate each of the following expressions. First one. Integral from 0 to 2, f of x, dx. This expression represents area under the curve from 0 to 2. So, area under the curve from 0 to 2. What's an area here? This expression represents area under the curve from 0 to 2. What's an area here? This area here is a rectangular region. The length is 4, the width is 2, length is 4, width is 2. Area of a rectangle is length times width, here 4 times 2 is 8. So that's the area under the curve from 0 to 2. Next. Integral from 2 to 3, f of x dx. Integral from 2 to 3, f of x dx. This expression represents area under the curve from 2 to 3. Area under the curve from 2 to 3 is this region here. That's an area under the curve from 2 to 3. This is a triangular region. This is a triangle. Area of a triangle is base times high, half of base times high. Here, base is 1. From 2 to 3, base is 1. And the high is 4. Area of triangle is half of base times high. Here, base is 1. And the high is 4. For this triangle here, area of a triangle is base area, half of base, half of base times high. Here, base from 2 to 3 is 1, and the height is 4. So you get half of 1 times 4, which is 2. That's area under the curve from 2 to 3. Next, integral from 3 to a, f of x, dx. Integral from 3 to a, from 3 to a, the area under the curve Actually, that's an area above the curve, so it will be negative. When the curve is below x-axis, area is negative. So, the area here is, this is a trapezoid. This area is negative, but the region here is a trapezoid. Since, since the area is below x-axis, it's negative. Since the curve is below x-axis, so the area is also below x-axis. So this area here is negative. When the area is above x-axis, it's positive. When the area is below x-axis, it's negative. And this region is a trapezoid. This region is a trapezoid. Area for trapezoid is what? Area of a trapezoid is half of upper base plus lower base times the height. 
area of trapezoid is half of upper base plus lower base times the height. So upper base, upper base is from 3 to A, upper base is 5. From 3 to A, upper base is 5. Lower base, from 7 to 5, lower base is 2. And the height, the height from 0 to negative 2, the height is 2. From 0 to negative 2, the height is 2. So area of a trapezoid is half of upper base plus lower base times the height, which is negative 7. So that's an area, that's an integral from 3 to a, f of x dx, which is an area under the curve from 3 to a. Since an area is below x axis, it's negative. Next. Integral from a to 12, f of x dx. Integral from a to 12, f of x dx. This expression represents area under the curve from a to 12. Area under the curve from a to 12. That's a, that's 12. That's the curve. So area under the curve from a to 12. This is a semicircle. This is a semicircle. And this area is above x axis, so it's passive. This area is above x axis, so it's passive. Area of a semicircle is what? We know the area of area of a circle is pi r square. In this semicircle here, diameter is t is four. From eight to twelve, diameter is four. So the radius is two. It's a semicircle, so it's half of pi r square. It's a semicircle, so times half. Pi r square. Radius is two. Since diameter is four, diameter from eight to twelve is four. So radius is two. So half of pi r square. If we multiply, we get two pi. That's an area under the curve from a to twelve. Next, integral from zero to three, f of x dx. This expression represents area under the curve from zero to three. From zero to three, area under the curve from zero to three. This region is a trapezoid. If we consider both of them together, area under the curve from 0 to 3, this is a trapezoid. Area of a trapezoid is half of upper base plus lower base times the height. So half of upper base, the upper base is 2. Upper base from 0 to 2 is 2. Lower base, lower base from 0 to 3 is 3. And the height here from 0 to 4, the height is 4. Together, 2, time, two plus 3 is 5, 5 plus 4 is 20, 20 times half is 10. That's an area under the curve from 0 to 3. Next. Integral from a to 10, f of x dx. Integral from a to 10, f of x dx. This expression, this expression represents area under the curve from a to 10. From a to 10. Area under the curve from a to 10. This is a quarter of a circle. Area under the curve from a to 10. This is a quarter of a circle. We know the area of a circle is pi r square. Here, radius is 2. Area of a circle is pi r square. And area of the curve from a to 10 is a quarter of a circle. So take area of a circle times a quarter. That's pi. So that's an area of the curve from a to 10. Next. Integral from 0 to a, f of x dx. Integral from 0 to a, f of x dx. 
This expression, we're looking for the area under the curve from 0 to A. From 0 to A. From 0 to A, we have these two regions. This region here and this region here. This region and this region. That's the area from zero to, under the curve from 0 to A. We have this region here and this region here. This region is positive since it's above S axis. And this area is negative since it's below S axis. This is passive area. This is negative area. So let's compute the passive area first. For the passive area, that's a trapezoid. Half of upper base plus lower base times the height. And this area is negative. This area is negative. That's another trapezoid. It's negative. Half of upper base plus lower base times the height. Upper base is 5. Lower base is 2. The height is 2. This area is passive. And this area is negative. That's why I add negative sign here. This area is negative. Together, I get 10 plus negative 7. 10 plus negative 7 is 3. So that's an area under the curve from 0 to A. Next, integral from 3 to 12, f of x dx. Area under the curve from 3 to 12. From 3 to 12. Area under the curve from 3 to 12. From 3 to 12. So this area here is negative, and this area is positive. Let's compute each of them individually. First of all, let's compute this area under the curve first. This area below S axis first. This is a trapezoid. This is a trapezoid. Then it's negative. It's below X axis. It's negative. Area of a trapezoid is half of upper base plus lower base times the height. And this area is passive. It's a semicircle. So it's half of pi r squared. Together we get negative 7 plus 2 pi. That's an area under the curve from 3 to 12. Next. Integral from 5 to 10 f of x dx. Integral from 5 to 10 f of x dx. From 5 to 10. This area here, area of the curve from 5 to 10. We have a small trapezoid here and a quarter of a circle here. For this trapezoid here, its area is negative since it's below, since it's below S axis. This area is negative. Area of the trapezoid is half of upper base plus lower base. Here, upper base here is 3. Lower base is 2 times the height. The height is 2 plus this area here. That's a quarter of a circle. That's a quarter pi r squared. Together we have negative 5 plus pi. That's negative 5. That's pi. So total area is negative 5 plus pi. Next, integral from 2 to 5, f of x dx. This expression represents area under the curve from 2 to 5. Area under the curve from 2 to 5. From 2 to 5. This area here, from 2 to 5. So we're looking for this area here. Area on the curve from 2 to 5. Area on the curve from 2 to 5. This is a triangle, and that's another triangle. This triangle is pass has passive area since it's above S axis. This triangle has passive area, 
and this triangle has negative area since it's below s axis. This triangle has negative area. Let's compute the first first triangle first. First triangle area is half of base times height. Base is one. Height is four. Half of base times height. That's the first triangle. The second triangle is below s axis. So its area is negative. Half of base times height. Here, base is 2. And the height is also 2. Base times height. Base is 2. Height is also 2. Together, half times 1 times 4 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times half is, is also 2. So I get negative 2 here. 2 plus negative 2 is 0. Area is 0 means the partial area and negative area they get completely cancelled. And the positive area and the negative area get completely cancelled. That's why area under the curve is zero. So area under the curve from five to from two to five is zero. Because the passive passive area completely cancel the negative area here. Next example. Evaluate each of the following expressions using area. In order to find integral using area, we must sketch a graph for each function first. First example, integral from 0 to 2, 2x dx. So let's graph the function first. The function here is y equal to 2x. How do we graph this function, y equal to 2x? This is a straight line. Y intercept is zero. Slope is two. When s is zero, y equal to zero. When s is two, y equal to four. So that's the graph from zero to two. And that's the area under the curve. We can see that it's a triangle. It's a triangle. For the area of a triangle, we use base area with base half of base times height. So the answer is half of base times height. Here, base is two. Height is four, which is four. So that's the an answer to this integral. Next, integral from zero to four. 1 plus half of x dx. In order to find integral using area, we need to graph the function first. Let's graph the function 1 plus half of x. Let's graph, let's graph the function y equal to 1 plus half of x. This is a linear function. y intercept is 1. Slope is a half, so it's a straight line. It's a straight line. Y intercept is 1. Slope is half. Half is passive, so the line is increasing. When s is 0, when s is 0, if I plug in 0, I get y equal to 1. When s is 4, if I plug in 4 here, half times 4 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3. So when s is 4, y is 3. That's an area under the curve from 0 to 4. That's an area under the curve from 0 to 4. How do we find this area here? This is a trapezoid. This is a trapezoid. That's an upper base. That's a lower base. And that's the height. If you look at it this way. That's an upper base. That's a lower base, and that's the height. Here you can see that upper base is 1, lower base is 3, from 0 to 3, lower base is 3, and the height is 4. So area of a trapezoid is half of upper base 
from lower base times the height, which is 4 times 4 is 16, 16 times half is 8. That's an area under the curve from 0 to 4, which is the value of this integral. Next. Integral from 2 to 6, 2 minus x dx. Integral from 2 to 6, 2 minus x dx. Let's sketch the graph first. The graph is 2 minus x. That's the function. Graph the function first. This is, this is a straight line. Y-intercept is 2. Slope is negative 1. Y-intercept is 2. Slope is negative 1. Negative 1 means the line is going downward. When s is 0, when s is 2, 2 minus 2 is 0. When s is 2, 2 minus 2 is 0. When s is 6, 2 minus 6 is negative 4. When s is 6, 2 minus 6 is 4. So when s is 6, y is negative 4. 2 minus 6 is negative 4. When, y, when s is 6, y is negative 4. That's an area between the curve and s axis. That's an area between the curve and, s, and s, x axis. And since this area is under, s, is under the s axis, it's below s axis, this is negative area. Since this area is below s axis, this is negative area. And this is a triangle, this is a triangle. Base is 4. Height is also 4. Area of a triangle is half of base times height. Half of base times height. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times half is A. I get negative A. That's the value for this integral. Next. Integral from negative 2 to 3. Absolute value of x dx. So let's graph the function first. The function is y equal to absolute value of, of x. The graph of y equal to absolute value of x is a V shape. The graph of y equal to absolute value of x is a V, v shape. From negative 2 to 3, negative 2 is here. When x is negative 2, y is positive 2. When x is positive 3, when x is positive 3, y is also positive 3. And that's an area on the curve from negative 2 to positive 3. That's an area under the curve from negative 2 to positive 3. So for the answer, we must calculate both areas and add them up. They are both positive areas. They are both above s-axis, so they are both positive areas. So for this, for this area here, it's a triangle. Area of triangle is half of base times height. Here, base is 2. Height is also 2. For this triangle here, base is 3. Height is also 3. So you get half of 3 times 3. That's 4 over 2 plus 9 over 2, which is 13 over 2. That's an area under the curve from negative 2 to 3. Next. Integral from 0 to 6, 
absolute value of x minus 2 plus 3 dx. Let's graph the function first. How do we graph this function? O equal to absolute value of x minus 2 plus 3. How do we graph this function? To graph this function, we need to use transformation. We know that O equal to absolute value of x is a V shape. So when we have x minus 2, when we subtract 2 from x, we shift the graph 2 units to the right side. When we subtract 2 from x, shift the graph 2 units to the right side. So when we subtract 2 from x, shift this graph 2 units to the right side. And then when we add 3 to the function, when we add 3 to the function, shift the entire graph 3 units up. Shift the entire graph 3 units upward. Shift this graph three units upward. So that's the graph y equal to absolute value of x minus two plus three. So that's a graph. Y equal to absolute value of s minus 2 plus 3. Now, we're looking for every end on the curve from 0 to 6. We're looking for, we are looking for every end on the curve from 0 to 6. If I plot in 0, what do we get? If I plot in 0 here, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Absolute, absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. 2 plus 3 is 5. When s is 0, y is 5. If I plot in 6, 6 minus 2 is 4. Absolute value of 4 is 4. 4 plus 3 is 7. So when x is, when x is 6, y is 7. When x is 6, y is 7. Y is 6, Y is 7. We are looking for area under the curve from 0 to 6. We are looking for area under the curve from 0 to 6. How do we find this area here? For this area, I can cut it into two pieces. For this area, I can cut it into two pieces. First piece from 0 to 2. Second piece from 2 to 6. So you can see that this is a trapezoid. That's another trapezoid. And they are both passive, so we can add them up. So for an answer, the first trapezoid, for the first trapezoid, look at this way. That's an upper base, that's a lower base, and that's the height. Upper base is 3. From 0 to 3, upper base is 3. Lower base is 5. From 0 to 5. The height is 2. The height is 2. So, first trapezoid area is half of upper base plus lower base times height. For the second trapezoid, look at this way. That's an upper base. That's a lower base. And that's the height. Upper base is 3, lower base is 7, from 0 to 7, lower base is 7, upper base is 3, lower base is 7, height is 4, from 2 to 6, and height is 4. So, 
another shape sewing, half of upper base plus lower base times the height, then adding up. 3 plus 4 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. 16 times half is 8. Next. 3 plus 7 is 10. 10 times 4 is 40. 40 times half is 20. So 8 plus 20 is 28. That's an area under the curve from 0 to 6. Next. Integral from net 4 to 4. Square root of 16 minus x squared dx. Let's, let's graph the function first. How do we graph the function y equal to square root of 16 minus x squared? How do we graph this function? How do we graph y equal to square root of 16 minus x squared? This function, I can first suppose square both sides. If I square both sides, I get y squared equal to 16 minus x squared. If I square both sides, I get y squared equal to 16 minus x squared. Then I can add x squared to both sides. I can add x squared to both sides. I get x squared plus y squared equal to 16. Next a circle. Center and origin with radius 4. Next a circle. Center and origin with radius 4. That's a circle, center and, center and origin with radius 4. However, in this function, y is always passive. In this function, y is always passive. So you only use upper half semicircle. This y is always passive. Only use upper half semicircle. So the graph of this function is an upper half semicircle. Since y is always passive, we don't, we don't have a lower half. We only, we only have an upper half semicircle. That's a graph. Radius is 4, so it's from negative 4 to 4, 0 in the middle. So the graph of this function is a half, it's an upper half semicircle. It's an upper half semicircle from negative 4 to 4. We are looking for area under the curve from negative 4 to 4. Area under the curve from negative 4 to 4. This is a semicircle. Area of a, of a semicircle. Area of a circle is pi r square. Here, radius is 4. Radius is 4. So area of a circle is pi r square. But this is a semicircle. So times half. Together, 4 square is 16. 16 times half is a, and get a pi. That's the answer for this integral. Next, integral from negative 4 to 0. Negative square root of 16 minus x squared dx. Let's graph the function first. Here the function is y equal to negative radical 16 minus x squared. Let's graph this function first. This function is y equal to Negative radical 16 minus x squared. How do we graph this function? I can first of all square up upside. If I square up upside, I get y squared on the left side. On the right side, when I square, double negative become positive. And square cancel square root, I get 16 minus x squared. Then I can add s, add s squared to both sides. I get s squared plus y squared equal to 16. That's a circle. Center and origin with radius 4. Next circle. Center and origin with radius 4. Next circle. Center and origin with radius 4. And for this function here, y is negative. For this function here, y is negative. Since y is negative, the, the graph must be below x-axis. So that's the graph. 
since y is negative, it must be below s axis. It won't have an upper half. It only has a lower half semicircle. This function is the lower half semicircle from negative 4 to 4. Lower half semicircle from negative 4 to 4. So it's a lower half semicircle from negative 4 to 4. This graph is in the lower half semicircle from negative 4 to 4, since y is negative. So, area from, we are looking for area under the curve from negative 4 to 0. From negative 4 to 0, that's an area between the curve and the x-axis. So, we are looking for area under the curve from negative 4 to 0. Here you can see that this area here is below x-axis, so it's a negative area. This area is below s axis, so it's a native area. It's a native area. The straight region is a quarter of a circle. The straight region here, the straight region here is a quarter of a circle. We know the area of a circle is pi r square. Here, radius is 4, so it's pi times 4 square. And the straight region is a quarter of a circle, so times 1 over 4. Then together, 4 square is 16. 16 times 1 over 4 is 4. So the answer is negative 4 pi. That's an area under the curve from negative 4 to 0. This area is negative area. Next, integral from 0 to 6. 3 plus square root of 36 minus x squared. How do we graph y equal to 3 plus square root of 36 minus x squared? How do we graph this function? How do we graph this function? This function looks very complicated. So let's graph the square root by itself first. Let's graph y equal to square root of 36 minus x squared first. Take care of this 3 later. Let's take care of this 3 later. Let me graph y equal to square root of 36 minus x squared first. How do we graph this function? If I square both sides, I get y square equal to 36 minus x square. That's a circle. If I move x square, I get x square plus y square equal to 36. That's a circle. If I add x square to both sides, I get x square plus y square equal to 36. That's a circle. Center and origin with radius 6. That's a circle. Center and origin with radius 6. That's a circle. Center and origin with radius 6. And since y is passive, since y is passive, we won't have an over half. We only have an upper half semicircle. Since y is passive, we only have an upper half semicircle. We only have an upper half semicircle. So the graph y equal to radical. 36 minus x minus x squared looks like this. That's a graph y equal to vertical 36 minus x squared. It's from negative 6 to 6, 0 in the middle. But that's not what we want. We want 3 plus vertical 36 minus x squared. How do we add 3 here? Remember, if I add 3 to the function, what do we get? If I add 3 to the function, what do I get? For any graph, if I add 3 to the function, I shift the graph 3 units upward. If I add 3 to the function, I shift the graph 3 units upward. So shift this graph 3 units upward. I shift the entire graph 3 units upward. 
That's the graph. Logical 36 minus s squared plus 3. That's what we want. That's the graph of this function. That's what we want here. So, this graph is an upper half semicircle with radius 6. And we shift it 3 units upward. We shift the graph 3, three units upward. That's the graph, y equal to 3 plus radical 36 minus s squared. Now, for integral from 0 to 6, we're looking for area under the curve. We're looking for area under the curve from 0 to 6. Area under the curve from 0 to 6. We're looking for this area here. Area under the curve from 0 to 6. How do we find this area here? I can cut it to two regions. For this area, I can cut it to two regions. The upper half, that's a quarter of a circle. The upper part, that's a quarter of a circle. The lower part is a rectangle. The lower part is a rectangle. Length is six, width is three. Length is six, width is three. That's a quarter of a circle. Radius is six. So, for the final answer, adding up. First of all, let's compute a quarter of a circle. A quarter of a circle is a quarter pi r squared. Here, radius is 6. Plus this rectangle. This rectangle length is 6, width is 3. 3 times 6. That's an area of this rectangle. Adding up. 6 squared is 36. 36 times a quarter is 9. I get 9 pi. 3 times 6 is 18. That's the value. For this integral, it represents it represent area under the curve from 0 to 6. So far, in the previous two examples, we learned how to find area under the curve for some special functions. In this example here, in this example here, we learned how to find area under the curve for some special functions. In general, in order to find area under the curve, it takes the following steps. Let f of x be a continuous function on the interval from a to b. Let f of x be a continuous function on the interval from a to b. In order to find area under the curve from a to b, in general, it takes the following steps. Step 1. Divide the interval a, b into n sub-intervals. So I first of all divide the interval a, b into n sub-intervals. Let me call this S1, S2, X3, in general, that's Xi minus 1, that's X sub i. The second last one is X sub m minus 1. Last one, B is Xn, B is Xn. In general, we call the first one A to be X0. So first of all, divide interval a, b into n sub-intervals. That's the first one, second one, third one, and so on. Note, the sub-intervals may or may not have the same length. The sub-intervals may or may not have the same length. So each sub-interval may have different lengths. First interval is wider, second interval is narrower. Next one is wider, next one is narrower. They may or may not have the same length. In general, we use x0, s1, s2, and xn to represent the boundary point of the sub-intervals. In general, we use x0, s1, s2, x3, and so on. Use this point to represent the boundary point of each sub-intervals. That's the boundary point of the first interval. That's the boundary point of the second interval, and so on. In general, we use x0, s1, s2, x3 to represent the boundary points of the sub-intervals. And this point, x0, s1, s2, they are also called partition points. This point, x0, s1, s2, sn, they are also called partition points. x0, s1, s2, s3, they are usually called partition points. They are the boundary points of the sub-intervals. 
They are also called partition points. Also, we usually use delta SI to represent the length of each subinterval. We use delta SI to represent the length of each subinterval. So the length of the first subinterval is called delta S1. That's the length of the first subinterval. And we use delta S2 to represent the length of the second subinterval. And we use delta X3 to represent the length of the third interval. We use delta SI to represent the length of the i's interval. And then for the last one, we use delta XN to represent the length of the last subinterval. So in general, we use delta SI to represent the length of each subinterval. How do we find the lengths? How do we find the lengths? For delta S1, how do we find delta S1? I can use S1 minus X0. S1 minus S0 is the length of delta S1. S1 minus X0 is the length of this, this interval here. And similarly, for delta S2, I use S2 minus S1. Use S2 minus S1, that's the length of the second subinterval, that's delta S2. And similarly, delta X3, I use X3 minus X2. And so on. That's the length of each subinterval. So, in general, delta S1 is S1 minus X0, delta S2 is X2 minus S1, and in general, delta SI is delta SI is SI minus SI minus 1. In general, delta SI is SI minus SI minus 1. Delta SI is SI minus SI minus 1. And that's the first step. Divide interval AB into n subintervals and find the length for each subinterval. That's step one. Step two. Pick sample point on each subinterval. Step two. Pick sample point on each subinterval. A sample point on each interval could be any point. A sample point could be any point on the subintervals. We sometimes use left end point, right end point, or mid point as sample point. Sample point could be anything. Sample point could be any point in the interval. Sometimes I use left end point. Sometimes I use right end point, or it could be mid point. That's the subinterval here. This point is called left end point. That's called the right end point. The point in the middle is called mid point. A simple point could be any point in the interval. Could be any point in the interval. Sometimes we use left end point or right end point or the mid point. It could be any point in the middle. A simple point could be any point in the middle. In general, we use S1 star, X2 star, and Xn star to represent the sample points on each subinterval. So for example, sample point could be any point in the interval. Let me call this point X1, X1 star. It could be any point in the interval. Let me in the second interval, let me pick this point here. Let me call this, this point S2 star. Sample point could be any point in the interval. Next interval, let me pick this point here. Let me call this X3 star. For the i's interval, I can pick Xi star. It could be any point in the interval. In the last, in the last interval, I pick Sn star. A simple point could be any point in the interval. A simple point could be any point in the subinterval. Sometimes we may use left end point, right end point, or mid point, but it could be any points. That's step two. Pick sample point or which subinterval. Pick sample point or which subinterval. That's step two. Step three. Use sample points to approximate the height of which subinterval. Step three. 
use simple points to approximate the height of each subintervals. But how can we do that? So here, I pick S, S1 star here. I try to use this point to approximate the height in this subinterval here. So I go up. Go up to the curve. I find f of s1 star. The point on the curve. This point is s1 star. The point on the curve is f of s1 star. I use this point to approximate the height in the interval. Use this point to approximate the height in the interval. Use this point to approximate the height in the interval. This point on the curve is called f of x2 star. Use this point to approximate the height in the subinterval. This point here on the curve is called f of x3 star. In the i's interval, use si to approximate the area, to approximate the height in the subinterval. This point here is f of xi star. This point here is an f, star, f of n star. F x, f x sub n star. Use this point to approximate the height in the subinterval. That's f of x n star. So in step three, we first of all use simple points to approximate the height on each subintervals. And then we try to find the area of each subintervals. Note, on each subintervals, the area under the curve is very close to the rectangle. The area under the area under the curve is very close to this rectangle. On each, on each subintervals, area under the curve is very close to this rectangle. And this rectangle has the width delta s i, and the height or the length of f of s i star which rectangle here which rectangle here the width is delta s i for example in the first one in the first rectangle here the width is delta s one and the height is f of s one star in the second sub interval the width is delta s two and the height is f of s two star in the third interval the width is delta x three and the height is f of s3 star, and so on. So, on each subinterval, area of the curve is very close to the rectangle with the width delta si, and the length, or and, and the height or the length of f of si star. Now, how do we find the area? We know that for area of a rectangle, we use length times width. For area of a rectangle, we use length times width. In the first rectangle. The length is f of s1 star. The width is delta of delta s1. For the second rectangle, the length is f of s2 star. The width is delta s2. In the third rectangle here, in the third interval, in the third subinterval, the length is the length is f of s3 star. The width is delta x3. And continue. In the last subinterval here, in the last subinterval here, the length is f of s n star. And the width is delta s n. The width is delta s n.
That's an area of which the tangles, on which sub-intervals. That's step three. Step four. Find the total area of all the tangles. Step four. Find the total, total area of all the tangles. So for step four, adding up. For the total area of all the tangles, adding up. For the total area of all the tangles, adding up. That's an area of an, in, on the first sub-interval. That's an area on the second sub-interval, adding up. That's an area of all the tangles. That's an area of the first rectangle, that's the second rectangle, that's the third rectangle, and that's the last rectangle, adding up. Next. Let me rewrite the total area using sigma notation. Let me rewrite the total area using sigma notation. How do I rewrite this expression using sigma notation? Let's observe the terms first. On each term, that's a function f. On each term, x stays the same. Star stays the same. Delta x stays the same. And the only difference is the index. Index varies from 1, 2, 3 to n. So take i from 1 to n. Index varies from 1 to n. Function f stays the same. x stays the same. 1, 2, 3 become index i. Star stays the same. Delta x stays the same. 1, 2, 3 become i. That's how we write total area using sigma notation. So the total area of all the tangles is this sigma i from 1 to n f of si star times delta si. Note, the total area of all the tangles it's an estimation of an area under the curve. This is this is an estimation of area under the curve. This is not an actual area under the curve. What we found here is an estimation of an area under the curve. This is not an actual area under the curve. Area of each rectangle is very close to an area under the curve, but it's not an exact area. So that's an estimation of area under the curve. Also, in general, the smaller each subinterval is the more accurate the estimation will be. The smaller each subinterval is, the more accurate the estimation will be. If I can make each subinterval to be very, very small, if I make subinterval to be very, very small, then the area of the area of the tangle will be very, very close to the area of the curve, like this one here. If I make subinterval very, very small, the area of the tangle will be very, very close to the area of the curve. So in general, the smaller each sub-interval is, the more accurate the estimation will be. Next, how do we find the actual area? How do we find the actual area under the curve? Next, let's, let's, let's make a conclusion here. In order to find actual area under the curve from A to B, we must take a limit. We must take a limit. Take a limit as maximum delta Si approach to zero. Take a limit as maximum delta Si approach to zero. If I make the maximum delta si approach to zero, that means I make the largest sub interval approach to zero. I make the largest sub interval approach to zero. If the largest, if the length, if the width of the largest sub interval approach to zero, then every sub interval will have a width of zero. If I make the width of the largest sub interval approach to zero, then the width of every sub interval will, will, will approach to zero. If I can make the width very, very small, then the area of the rectangle will be very, very close to the actual area under the curve. If I take a limit, this will be the actual area under the curve. So this expression represents the actual area under the curve from A to B. This is the definition of the definite integral. This is the definition of this integral. This expression here is the definition of this integral. And the expression, this expression, sigma i from 1 to n, f of si star times delta si. This expression has a name. It's called the Riemann sum. This expression has a name. It's called the Riemann sum.
This expression has a name. The expression without limit is called the Riemann sum. Next, let's look at some examples about finding area under a curve. The f of x equal to x squared plus 1. It's the main area under the curve on the interval from negative 2 to 4 using four sub-intervals with partition points x1, x2, x3 and use x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, x4 star as sample points. Here we are looking for area under the curve over the interval from negative 2 to 4. Let's draw the interval first. The interval is from negative 2 to 4. Next, let's plot the partition points. Let's plot the partition points. Partition points are 0, 0 0.5, and 3. 0 somewhere here. That's S1. 0 0.5 is very close to 0. Somewhere here. That's S2. And X3 is 3. Number 3 is somewhere here. That's X3. In general, we call the first point x0, and we call the last point x4. First step, plot the partition points. Next, find a width for each sub-intervals. Here we have four sub-intervals, one, two, three, four. Next, find the width for each sub-intervals. We have four sub-intervals, one, two, three, four. Find a width for each sub-intervals. Delta S1, Delta S2, Delta X3, and Delta X4. How do we find their widths? Delta S1, I can use X1 minus X0. For Delta S1, I use S1 minus X0, which is 0 minus negative 2, that's 2. For delta x2, I use x2 minus s1. That's 0 0.5 minus 2. So it's 0 0.5 minus 0. I get 0 0.5. Next. For delta x3, I use x3 minus x2. x3 minus x2 is 3 minus 0 0.5. That's 2.5. Next, for delta x4, we use x4 minus x3. That's 4 minus 3 equal to 1. And also, we know x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, x4 star. Then, once I know delta S1, delta S2, delta S3, and so on, then we know the sample points. I can use this formula to find the area under the curve. That's the estimation. Then we know that the total area is approximately f of S1 star times delta S1 plus f of x2 star times delta s2 f plus f of x3 star times delta x3 plus f of x4 star times delta s4 then plugging numbers plugging numbers x1 star is negative 1.2 delta s1 is 2 f of s2 star is 0 0.4 delta s2 is 0 0.5 f of s3 star is 1.5 delta x3 is 2.5 f of s4 star is 3.8 delta s4 is 1 then, next, 
for f of negative 1.2, I plug in net, I plug negative 1.2 into function f. So I get negative 1.2 squared plus 1 times 2 plus f of 0 0.4. For f of 0 0.4, I plug in 0 0.4 into the function here. I get 0 0.4 squared plus 1 times 0 0.5. Next, for f of 1.5, I plug in 1.5 into function f. I get 1.5 squared plus 1 times 2.5 plus f of 3.8. For f of 3.8, I plug in 3.8 into function f. I get 3.8 squared plus 1 times number 1. And then use calculator. Here I use my calculator, I get 29.8. 025. Use calculator for this answer. I get 29.025. Next example. Redo example 1 using left end point and sample points. If I redo example 1, the sub intervals will be exactly the same. So x0, x1, x2, x3, x4 will be the same. Therefore, the, the width of the sub intervals delta s1, delta s2, delta x3, delta s4 will also be the same. So let me copy delta s1, s2, x3, x4 over. Let me copy this over. Here, delta s1 is 2. Delta s2 is 0 0.5. Delta x3 is 2.5. And delta x4 is 1. I copy delta s1, s2, x3, s4 over from here. Next. We want to find a sample point. In this example, we are using left endpoint as sample points. How do we find a sample point here? What's S1 star? In the first interval, in the first sub-interval, in this interval here, this is called a left endpoint. That's called a right endpoint. Here, we are, looking, we are using left endpoint as sample point. So left endpoint is negative 2. This is called left endpoint. This is called right endpoint. Here, in the first interval, I, I use the left endpoint as a sample point. So S1 star is, is negative 2. How about S2 star? That's in the second interval. That's in the second sub interval. This is the left endpoint. This is the right endpoint. Here, we use the left endpoint. So I use 0. What's X3 star? In the third interval here, that's the, that's the left endpoint, and that's the right endpoint. Here I use left endpoint of the third interval, so it would be 0 0.5. And what's, what's S4 star? In the fourth sub interval, that's the left endpoint, and that's the right endpoint. Here, left endpoint is number 3. That's the sample point of which sub intervals. Next, use Riemann sum. Use this formula to find an area. We use this, this, this formula to, to estimate the area. So the total area here. The formula says f of s1 star times delta s1 plus f of s2 star times delta s2 plus f, f of x3 star times delta s4, delta s3, plus f of s4 star, times delta s4. Then, plotting numbers. x1 star is negative 2. delta s1 is 2. f of s2 star, s2 star is 0. I get it's f of 0, times delta s2. delta s2 is 0 0.5. Plus f of x3 star, x3 star is 0 0.5 times delta x3 delta x3 is 2.5 plus f of x4 star x4 star is 3 times delta x4 
Dot S4 is wrong. Then we plug in negative 2, 0, 0 0.5, and 3 into function f here. Function f is s squared plus 1. So plugging each value into function f, I get negative 2 squared plus 1 times 2. If I plug in 0, I get 0 squared plus 1 times 0 0.5. If I plug in 0 0.5, I get 0 0.5 squared plus 1 times 2.5. If I plug in 3, I get 3 squared plus 1 times 1. And then use calculator for the answer. Type this in the calculator. I get 23.625. Let's estimate the area under the curve using left endpoint. Next. Redo example 1. Using right endpoint and sample points. Redo example one, using right end points as sample points. So if I redo, if we redo example one, the sub interval will be exactly the same. The sub intervals will be exactly the same. So delta s one, s two, x three, x four will be exactly the same. Let me copy delta s one, s two, s three, s four over. Here delta s one is two. Delta s two is zero point five. Delta x3 is 2.5. Delta s4 is 1. Next, let's try to find a sample point. In this example, we are using right end points as sample points. In the first interval here, let's call the left end point, let's call the right end point. So in the first interval, I use left and right end point as sample point. So in the first interval, the right end point is 0. x2 star. In the second interval, let's call the left end point, let's call the right end point. I use the right end point as sample point, which is 0 0.5. For x3 star, that's the sample point in the third interval. That's the third sub interval. This is called left endpoint, this is called right endpoint. Here I use number 3 as my sample point. This is right endpoint. So in the third interval, I use number 3 as my sample point. What's S4 star? That's the sample point in the fourth sub interval. In the fourth sub interval, that's called a left endpoint, that's called a right endpoint. Here I'm using the right endpoint as sample point. So I use number 4 as my sample point. Then, we use this formula to estimate the area under the curve. So the total area under the curve is f of s1 star times delta s1 plus f of s2 star times delta s2 plus f of x3 star times delta x3 plus f of x4 star times delta s4. Then plugging numbers, plugging numbers. f of s1 star, s1 star is 0, times delta x, delta s1, delta s1 is 2, plus f of s2 star, s2 star is 0 0.5, times delta s2, delta s2 is 0 0.5, plus f of x3 star, x3 star is 3 times delta x3 delta x3 is 2.5 plus f of x f of s4 star x4 star is 4 times delta s4 delta s4 is 1 then plugging the values 
0, 0 0.5, 3, and 4 into function f. If I plug in 0, I get 0 squared plus 1 times 2. If I plug in 0 0.5, I get 0 0.5 squared plus 1 times 0 0.5. If I plug in number 3, if I plug in number 3, I get 3 squared plus 1 times 2.5. If I plug in 4, if I plug in 4, I get 4 squared plus 1 times 1. And then type this type this to your calculator. Here I get 44.625. Next example, redo example 1 using midpoints as sample points. So first of all, the sub-intervals stays the same. So data S1, data S2, data S3, data S4 must be the same. Let me copy this value over. From example 1, data S1 is 2. Data S2 is 0 0.5. Data S3 is 2.5. Data S4 is 1. So I copy this from example 1. Next, try to find a sample point. In this example, we use midpoints as sample point. How do we find a sample point here? How do we find a midpoint? How do we find a midpoint in the first sub interval here? How do we find a midpoint? For the midpoint, we add the endpoints and divide by 2. For the midpoint, I add the endpoint, divide by 2. For midpoint, always add the endpoints and divide by 2. So add the endpoints, divide by 2. Negative 2 plus 0, divide by 2. Negative 2 plus 0, divide by 2. That's negative 1. For x2 star, that's the sample point in the second interval. How to find the midpoint here? Same thing. For the midpoint, we add the endpoints and divide by 2. For the midpoint in a sub-interval, we add the endpoints and divide by 2. 0 plus 0 0.5 and divide by 2. Add the endpoints and divide by 2. I get 0 0.25. What's x3? What's x3 star? x3 star is the midpoint in the third interval. x3 star is the midpoint in the third interval. So I add the endpoints and divide by 2 n endpoints and divide by 2. 0 0.5 plus 3 divide by 2. 0 0.5 plus 3 is 3.5. 3.5 divided by 2 is 1.75. For x4 star, that's the midpoint in the fourth interval. So n endpoints and divide by 2. 3 plus 4 divided by 2 is 3.5. So that's how we find the midpoints of each sub interval. That's how we find midpoints of each sub interval. In this problem, we are using midpoint as sample points. So that's our S1 star, S2 star, X3 star, and X4 star. Next, we use this formula to estimate the area under the curve. The formula says f of s1 star times delta s1 plus f of s2 star times delta s2 plus f of x3 star times delta x3 plus f of s4 star times delta s4. Then plotting the values. f of s1 star, s1 star here is negative 1. Delta S1 is 2. F of S2 star here. S2 star is 0 0.25. Delta S2 is 0 0.5. F of S3 star. 
x3 star is 1.75 times delta x3. Delta x3 is 2.5 plus f of x4 star. f4 star is 3.5 times delta x4. Delta x4 is 1. Then plugging these values into function f. Function f is x squared plus 1. Function f is x squared plus 1. So plotting these values. If I plot in 1, I get, if I plot in negative 1, I get negative 1 squared plus 1, and then times 2. If I plot in 0 0.25, I get 0 0.25 squared plus 1 times 0 0.5. If I plug in 1.75, I get 1.75 squared plus 1 times 2.5. If I plug in 3.5, I get 3.5 squared plus 1 times 1. And then type these values to your calculator. In my calculator, I get 27.9375. That's an area under the curve. That's an estimated area under the curve using midpoint and sample points. Next, let's observe the definition of definite integral again. In the formula here, we can see that finding the Riemann sum is not hard, as we did in the previous example. Finding the Riemann sum is not hard. However, this limit, as the maximum delta SI approach to zero, this limit doesn't look easy. Then what should we do? Keep the following idea in mind. Note, in a definition of definite integral, taking the limit as the maximum delta SI approach to zero is not easy. In order to simplify the limit, we need to use subintervals with the same width. Here we'll use the subintervals with the same width. If all subintervals have the same width, then delta S1 will be the same as delta S2, the same as delta S3, da, 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 they, they will all be the same as delta Sn. And then, if they are all the same, I can call them equal to, I can call them delta X. If they are all the same, I make them equal to delta X. How do we find delta X here? How do we find delta X here? Suppose I divide interval AB into N subintervals. If they all look, the, if they all have the same width, if they all have the same width, delta S one equal to delta S two equal to delta X n. If they are all the same, I call them delta x. We have n subintervals. If they all have the same width, then to find the width of each subinterval, I take the total length. Take the total length. B minus a is the total length, divided by the number of subintervals. From x x zero to x n, there are n subintervals. That's delta x. That's the width of each subinterval the width of each subinterval. If they all have the same width, and we know that they are n subintervals, then to find the length of each interval, I take the total length divided by the number of subintervals. That's the length, that's the width of each subinterval. So we know that delta x is the total length divided by the number of subintervals. If they all have the same length, if they all have the same width, I take the total width divided by the number of subintervals. That's delta x. That's the width of each subinterval. Once we once we know this formula, we know that as n approaches to infinity, as n approaches to infinity, that's a constant. B minus a is a constant. We have a constant over infinity. Constant over infinity must be zero. So we know that as n approaches to infinity, delta x approaches to zero. Hence, the maximum delta s i will be zero. If every subinterval goes to zero. If every subinterval goes to zero, 
if every sub interval goes to zero, if the width of every sub interval goes to zero, of course the largest one goes to zero. So as delta s goes to zero, the maximum delta s i goes to zero. If every sub interval, if the length of every sub interval goes to zero, then the length of the maximum sub interval will, will also be zero. So once we know this formula, the definition of definite integral can be it can be written as the limit this limit maximum delta s i approach to zero can be rewrite as the limit n approach to infinity. Riemann sum stays the same, but the only difference is delta s i is the same as delta x because delta s one, s two, s three they are all the same. So I use delta x to represent delta s i, where delta x, delta x is b minus a over n. So the defini the def definition of definite integral can be rewrite in this form. This way is a little easier. The Riemann sum is the same, but the limit is much easier. Taking limit is much much easier. Next, let's look at an example about using this new formula. Let f of x equal to x squared plus 1. If you made the area under the curve on the closed interval from negative 2 to 4, using 4 sub-intervals with the same width, and use left endpoints as sample points. In order to use this new formula, first of all we need to find delta x. Delta x is always b minus a over n. In the formula here, a and b represent the interval. A and B represent the interval. The smaller number is always A. The larger number is always B. So plug in. We have 4 minus negative 2. N represent number of sub-intervals. Here, N represent number of sub-intervals. Here, we are using 4 sub-intervals. So N must be 4. Then we have 6 over 4, which is 1.5. So dot X is 1.5, which means the width of each sub-interval is 1.5. Next, let's draw the interval. Let's draw the interval. For this interval, we start from negative 2. The width of each sub-interval is 1.5. So, negative 2 plus 1.5 is negative 0 0.5. That's in the first sub-interval. Negative 0 0.5 plus 1.5 is 1. That's in the second sub-interval. 1 plus 1.5 is 2.5. That's in the third sub-interval. 2.5 plus 1.5 is 4. That's in the fourth sub-interval. Draw the interval first. Then, based on the interval, find a simple point. Based on the interval, find a simple point. In this problem, we use the left endpoint as sample point. So on the first interval here, the sample point is negative 2. In the first interval here, that's the left endpoint, that's the right endpoint. So the left endpoint is negative 2. So S1 star is negative 2. The sem second sample, sample point, look at the second sub-interval here. That's the left endpoint, that's the right endpoint. So the left endpoint is negative 0 0.5. That's x2 star. For x3 star, look at the third sub-interval here. In the third sub-interval, that's the left endpoint, that's the right endpoint. We are using left endpoint. So left endpoint is 1. That's x3 star. Next, for x4 star, the simple point in the fourth sub-interval. That's the fourth sub-interval. This is the left endpoint, this is the right endpoint. We're using the left endpoint. So left endpoint here is 2.5. That's the simple point. Next, use this formula to find area under the curve. Use, use this formula to estimate area under the curve. The formula says, The total area under the curve is approximately f of s1 star times delta x. 
plus f of x2 star times delta x plus f of x3 star times delta x. plus f of x4 star times delta x. If you observe these terms, we can see that delta x is exactly the same. So I can pull out a common factor. If I pull out a common factor, what's left is f of x1 star plus f of x2 star plus f of x3 star plus f of x4 star. Then plotting, delta x is 1.5, delta x is 1.5. x1 star is negative 2. x2 star is negative 0 0.5. x3 star is 1. x4 star is 2.5. Then for f of negative 2, we plug in negative 2 into the function. For f of negative 0 0.5, plug in negative 0 0.5 into the function. For f of 1, plug in 1 into the function. For f of 2.5, plug in 2.5 into the function. Then type this in the calculator. Here I get an answer. 23.25. That's my answer in the calculator. This is the estimated area under the curve. This is not the actual area. For actual area, we must take limit as n goes to infinity. This is the estimated area under the curve using left end points as, sub as sample points. Next, redo example 2 using right end point as sample points. So, same procedure. We first of all find delta x. Delta x is always b minus a over n. In example 2, that's a, that's b. We are using four sub intervals, so a is 4. So, we have 4 minus negative 2 over 4 which is 6 over 4, that's 1.5. Next, draw the intervals. For the interval, start from, start from negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1.5 is negative 0 0.5. That's in the first sub-interval. 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 plus 1.5 is 1. That's the second sub-interval. 1 plus 1.5 is 2.5. That's the third sub-interval. 2.5 plus 1.5 is 4. That's the fourth sub-interval. Next, let's find the right end point. So for S1 star, we use right end point in the first sub-interval. In the first sub-interval. That's the first sub-interval. That's the left end point. That's the right end point. So I use negative 0 0.5 as a sample point. For x2 star, look at the second sub-interval. That's the second sub-interval. This is the left end point, this is the right end point. So here I use 1. This 1 is my sample point in the second sub-interval. Next, for x3 star, in the third sub-interval, pick a sample point. Simple point is the, is the right end point. This is the left end point, this is the right end point. So here I pick 2.5. Next, for x4 star, in the fourth sub interval, this is the left end point, this is the right end point. Here we pick the right end point, which is 4. So those are the simple points on each sub interval. Next, use this formula to find area under the curve. This is est estimation. So the total area 
is approximately f of x1 star times delta x plus f of x2 star times delta x plus f of x3 star times delta x plus f, f of x4 star times delta x. Here we can see that delta x is a common factor, so I can pull it outside. Since delta x is the same everywhere, I can pull it outside. If I pull out delta x, what's left is f of x1 star plus f of x2 star plus f of x3 star plus f of x4 star then plotting the values dot x is 1.5 x1 star is negative 0 0.5 so I got f of negative 0 0.5 f of x2 star is 1 x2 star is 1 so I get f of 1 x3 star is 2.5 so I get f of 2.5 x4 star is 4 I get f of 4 then plugging plugging these values into function f function f is x squared plus 1 So plugging the values into the function, I get 1.5 times negative 0 0.5 squared plus 1. Plugging negative 0 0.5 into the function f. Next, plugging 1 into function f. I get 1 squared plus 1. Next, plugging 2.5 2 into function f. I get 2.5 squared plus 1. Next, plugging 4 into function f. I get 4 squared plus 1. Then calculate this in the calculator. Here I get 41.25. So let's estimate the area under the curve using right end points as sample point. Next. We do example 2. Using midpoints as simple point. We do example two using midpoints as simple point. So first step, find delta x. First step, find delta x. The formula for delta x is always b minus a over n. The formula for delta x is always b minus a over n. So in the interval here, let's a, let's b. If the smaller number is always a, the larger number is always b. And n is the number of sub-intervals. Here n is 4. n represents the number of sub-intervals. Here n is 4. So plugging, I get 4 minus negative 2 over 4, which is 6 over 4. 6 over 4 is 1.5. Next, draw sub intervals using delta x. Draw sub intervals using delta x. For an interval, it always, it always start from the smaller number here. Start from negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1.5 is negative 0 0.5. That's the first sub interval. Negative 0 0.5 plus 1.5 is 1. That's the second sub-interval. 1 plus 1.5 is 2.5. That's the third sub-interval. 2.5 plus 1.5 is 4. That's the fourth sub-interval. Next, based on the interval here, based on the sub-interval here, find the sample points. Based on the sub-intervals, find the sample point. Here we use midpoint and sample point. In the first sub-interval, we are looking for the midpoint. In, in order to find the midpoint, we add the endpoints and divide by 2. In order to find the midpoint, we add the endpoints and divide by 2. 
So we take negative 2 plus negative 0 0.5 and divide by 2. Here I get negative 1.25. For x2 star, do the same thing. In the second sub interval, we're looking for the midpoint. So n the end points and divide by 2. n the end points and divide by 2. Take negative 0 0.5 plus 1 and then divide by 2. I get positive 0 0.25. For x3 star, x3 star is the midpoint in the third sub interval. That's the third sub interval. For the midpoint, we add the endpoints and then divide by 2. Add the endpoints and then divide by 2. 1 plus 2.5 divided by 2. I get 3.5. 3.5 divided by 2 is 1.75. Next, x4 star. That's the midpoint of the fourth sub interval. So for the midpoint in the fourth sub interval, we add the endpoints and then divide by 2. Add the endpoints and then divide by 2. I get 2.5 plus 4 divided by 2. 2.5 plus 4 is 6.5. 6.5 divided by 2 is 3.25. Those are the sample points. And then use the same formula to find the area under the curve. The total area is approximately f of x1 star times delta x plus f of x2 star times delta x plus f of x3 star times delta x plus f of x4 star times delta x Here we can see that delta x looks exactly the same everywhere So I can factor pull out delta x If I pull out delta x, what's left is f of x1 star plus f of x2 star plus f of x3 star plus f of x, x4 star then plug in the values dot x is 1.5 x1 star is negative 1.25 x2 star is 0 0.25 x3 star is 1.75 x4 star is 3.25 Then, plug in the values into function f Function f is x squared plus 1 So we plug in the values, I get negative 1.25 squared plus 1 plus 0.25 squared plus 1 plus 1.75 square plus 1 plus 3.25 square plus 1 and then use calculator use calculator to calculate this I get 28.875 let's estimate the area under the curve using midpoint as sample points next Let's go back to the simplified formula for the definition of definite integral here. In this formula, we want to take a limit as n goes to infinity for the Riemann sum. In the Riemann sum, we have xi star. xi star is a sample point, which means it could be any point on a sub-interval. If this point is not fixed, we will take a limit as n goes to infinity. It's still complicated. So, in order to take a limit here, we need to further simplify this formula. Next, in order to further simplify the definition of definite integral, we will fix we will fix the right end point to be the sample point. So, on each, on each sub interval now, sample point in general could be any point on the sub interval. Now I will fix the sample point to be the right end point. So, in the first sub interval, that's the first sub interval. This is the right end point. So I will fix as one star to be s1. In the second sub-interval, 
That's the second sub interval. I have fixed the sample point to be the right endpoint, which is F2. And in the, that's the third sub interval. In the third sub interval, I'll fix the right endpoint to be the sample point. So X3 star will be X3. And the last one, I'll fix the right endpoint to be the I'll fix right end point to be the sample point. So Sn star will be Sn. So I'll fix the right end point to be I'll fix the right end point to be sample points. That means S1 star will be S1. The sample point is here. Right end point is here. In the second interval, that's a right end point. That's a right end point. So S1 star will be S1. S2 star will be S2. X3 star will be X3. And Sn star will be Sn. So I fixed S1 star to be S1, S2 star to be S2, Sn star to be Sn. Hence, the definition of definite integral can be written as this integral from A to B f of x dx is limit takes summation i from 1 to n f of si. Now it's f of si. Instead of f of, f of, s, f of si star, I write f of si because I pick si as simple point times delta x where delta x is b over a over n delta x is b over a over n and si is a plus i delta x how do we get this formula si is a plus i delta x next let me show you how we get this formula observe this observe s1 s1 is here s1 is here the gap here from A to S1 is delta x. So S1 can be written as A plus 1 delta x. S1 can be written as A plus 1 delta x. How about S2? From X2 to A, there are two gaps here. So S2 can be written as A plus 2 delta x. So in general, Si can be written as a plus i delta x. S1 is a plus 1 delta x. S2 is a plus 2 delta x. So in general, Si is a plus i delta x. That's the simplified formula for the definition of definite integral. That's the simplified formula for the definition of definite integral. Next, let's look at an example here. Let f of x be s cubed. If the main area under the curve on the interval from 0 to 2, part A use 4 sub intervals, part B use 8 sub intervals, part C use 20 sub intervals. For any problems about area under the curve, if we don't specify partition points, we will use sub intervals with the same width. Also, if we doesn't specify sample points, we can choose any point to be sample point. In general, to make it easier, we choose the right end point to be the sample points. So for part A, since we use the sub intervals with the same width, we can find delta x first. Formula for delta x is always b minus a over n, where a and b are the values in the interval. The smaller one is a, larger one is b. So b minus a is 2 minus 0. n is the number of sub-intervals. Here, here we are using 4 sub-intervals. So n is 4. 2 divided by 4 is, is 0.5. Next, draw interval. For the interval, for the sub-interval, it starts from 0. 0 plus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 is, is 1. 1 plus 0 0.5 is 1.5. 1.5 plus 0 0.5 is 2. We are, we are using four sub intervals. So that's the sub intervals. First one, second one, third one, fourth one. In general, we use, if it doesn't specify sample points, we use right end point as sample points. So S1 star is 0 0.5. S2 star is 1. X3 star is 1.5. S4 star is 2. 
use right endpoint as simple points. Then use the formula. The total area under the curve. f of s1 star times delta x plus f of s2 star times delta x plus f of s3 star times delta x plus f of s4 star times delta x then I can pull out delta x if I pull out delta, delta x I get f of s1 star plus f of s x2 star plus f of x3 star plus f of s4 star then plug the values delta x is 0 0.5 x1 star is 0 0.5 x2 star is 1 x3 star is 1.5 x4 star is 2 Then plotting 0 0.5 into the function, into function f, I get 0 0.5 cube. Plotting 1 into the function, I get 1 cube. Plotting 1.5, I get 1.5 cube. Plotting 2, I get 2 cube. Then use calculator. Here I get 6.25. It's part A. Part B, do the same thing. Use A sub intervals. Find delta x first. Delta x is always b minus a over a over n. Here, a and b are the values on the interval. That's a, that's b. And n is the number of subintervals. Since we are using a subintervals, n is a. So I get 2 minus 0 over a, which is 0 0.25. Next, draw subintervals. Start from zero. Zero plus zero plus zero point two five is zero point two five. Zero point two five plus zero point two five is zero point five. Zero point five plus zero point two five is zero point seventy five. Zero point seventy five plus zero point two five is one. One plus zero point two five is one point two five. One point two five plus zero point zero point two five is one point five. One point five plus zero point two five is one point seventy five. 1.75 plus 0 0.25 is 2. That's the sub intervals. Then choose a sample point. In general, we choose a right end point as a sample point. So that's the right end point, right end point, right end point. S1 star is 0 0.25. S2 star is 0 0.5 x3 star is 0 0.75 and so on the last one is a star is 2 in the last sub interval that's in the last that's in the right end point next use the formula the total area is f of s1 star times delta x plus f of s2 star times delta x plus da, 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 da. the last one f of s a star times delta x then i can pull out delta x, delta, delta x. that's a common factor i can pull it out if i pull out delta x i get f of s1 star plus f of s2 star plus f of s a star Then delta x is 0 0.25. f of s1 star is f of 0 0.25. f of s2 star is f of 0 0.5. Plus f of s a star is 2. Then plugging, plugging 0 0.25 into the function. f of x is s cubed the number here. I get 0 0.25 cube 
plus 0 0.5 cube. Use all this number here, from 0 0.25 to 2. Then use your calculator. Here I get 5.0625 in my calculator. Plus C. Use 20 sub intervals. So same procedure. Find dot x first. That's B minus A over N. A and B are the values on the interval. A and B are the values on the interval. The smaller one is A, the larger one is B. So you get 2 minus 0 over N. N is number of sub intervals. In part C, we are using 20 sub intervals. So N is 20. Then 2 divided by 20 is 0 0.1. Next, draw sub intervals. Start from 0. 0 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.2. And then 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. The last one must be must be two. The last one must be the right end point. The second last one here is one point nine. Then the last one is two. The last one is always the right end point in the interval here. The last value is always the end point. The last value must be the same as the right end point on the interval. Now choose the right end point a simple point. So S one star is zero point one. S2 star is 0 0.2. X3 star is 0 0.3. And then the last one, since we are, since we are using 20 sub intervals, X20 star in the last sub interval here, the right end point is 2. And then use the formula. The total area is approximately. This is an estimation, that's not an actual area. This is an estimation, that's not an actual area. F of S1 star times delta x plus F of X2 star times delta x and keep going until the last one f of x20 star times delta x and here you can see that delta x is a common factor I can pull it out if I pull out delta x I get f of s1 star plus f of s2 star plus f of x20 star And then plotting the values. Delta x is 0 0.1. F of s1 star. S1 star is 0 0.1. S2 star is 0 0.2. Until the last one. F of 20 star is 2. Then use calculator. In the calculator, we must use all the values. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, until... 1.8, 1.9, and 2. In the calculator, we must use all values here. Here, 0 0.1 is 0 0.1 square, 0 0.1 cube. Plugging each values into the function f, into function f here. 0 0.2 cube plus 2 cube. Here, I, I, wrote, I, write, I write dots here, but when you type into the calculator, don't, don't type dots. You need to write all the numbers. From 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, go all the way to 1.8, 1 1.9, and 2. In the calculator, don't write that here. You must plug in all the values in the calculator. And then, in my calculator, I get 4.41. In general, in general, we know that the more sub interval we use, the more accurate the answer is. The more accurate the answer is. The more sub interval we use, the more accurate the answer is. In order, to, in order to find the actual area under the curve, we must use infinitely many sub-intervals. 
so we must take limit as n approaches to infinity. In order to find the actual area under the curve, we must take limit as n approaches to infinity. Next, in example 3, find the actual area under the curve. In order to find the actual area under the curve, we must use infinitely many sub-intervals with the same widths, which means we need to use definition of definite intervals. Then we find the Riemann, find the Riemann sum first, and then take limit as n, n approach to infinity. So let's solve it here. Let me first of all write down the formula. To go from a to b, f of x dx equals my limit as n approach to infinity. Sigma i from 1 to n, f of s i times dot x, where dot x is b minus a over n, and s i equal to a plus i dot x. That's the formula. Let's use it here. First of all, we need to find dot x. Dot x is always b minus a over n. So in the interval here, that's a, that's b. We get 2 minus 0 over n. Here we cannot plug in value for n. Since we need to take a limit as n goes to infinity, we cannot plug in a value for n. So leave it in terms of n. Dot x here is 2 over n. Next, find si. Next, find si. si is a plus i dot x. In the interval, the smaller number is a, larger number is b. So that's a. Here a is 0. i stays the same. Dot x is 2 over n, we just found. Dot x is 2 over n. a is 0. And then if I simplify, I get 2i over n. That's si. Next, compute f of si. Here, si is 2i over n. For f of 2i over n, I plug 2i over n into the function f. Plug 2i over n here. I get 2i over n cube. If I plug in, I get 2i over n cube. If I simplify, I get a i cube over n cube. That's f of si. Now we are ready to take limit. Let me write everything over. Integral from 0 to 2. 0 to 2 is a and b. In the interval here, this is a, this is b. So integral from 0 to 2. f of x is s cube dx. That's the limit as n approaches infinity. Sigma i from 1 to n. f of si. f of si is a i cube times n cube times dot x. Dot x here is 2 over n. Then take a limit. Simplify first and then take a limit. Let's multiply first. I get sigma i from 1 to n of 16i cube over n to the power 4. Multiply first. I get 16i cube times n to the power of 4 over n to the power of 4. Next, for this sigma here, we treat i as a variable. Everything, everything other than i is a constant. Everything other than i is considered as a constant. So I can pull out 16. Pull out n to the power of 4. I get 16 over n to the power of 4 times sigma i from 1 to n of i cube. Then
Next. We try to derive this expression without sigma notation. We try to derive this expression without sigma notation. Earlier today, we know that sigma i from 1 to n of i cube is n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. So, use the formula. Sigma i from i from 1 to n of i cube is n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. If I simplify, I can divide top and bottom by 4. If I simplify, I can divide top and bottom by 4. What's left is number 4 on the top. Then cancel n squared from top and bottom. Cancel n squared from top and bottom. What's left is n squared on the bottom. And on the top, we have n plus 1 squared. Next, I can write number 4 by itself. For n plus 1 squared over n squared, they both contain square. I can pull out square. I get n plus 1 over n square. Pull out square. They both contain square. Next, I can take n divided by n. That's 1. 1 divided by n is 1 over n squared. And then take limit. Take limit as n approaches infinity. If I plot infinity here, 1 over infinity is 0. I get 4 times 1 plus 0 squared. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 squared is 1. 1 times 4 is 4. And so it's 4. That's an actual area under the curve. That's an actual area under the curve. If we compare this answer with the previous problem, in part A, when we are using four soft intervals, the estimated area is 6.25. In part B, when we use A sub intervals, the estimated area is 5.06025. In part C, when we use 20 sub intervals, the estimated area is 4.41. So here you can see that the more sub intervals we use, the more accurate the answer is. And if we use infinitely many sub intervals, We've got, it, we've got an actual area and then a curve. Next, evaluate each of the following integrals as a limit of Riemann sum, which means we need to use the definition of definite integral. Let me run a formula here first. Integral from a to b, f of x dx, is the limit as n approaches to infinity. Sigma i from 1 to n, f of s i, times delta x, where delta x is b minus a over n, and s i is a plus i delta x. So, part a. Let's find delta x first. Delta x is always b minus a over n. In the integral, that's a, that's b. The lower limit is a, upper limit is b. So plug in. I get 4 minus 0 over n. Leave n the way it is. I get 4 over n. Let's start x. Next, find xi. xi is a plus i delta x. Here, a is 0. That's a and b. This is a, a is 0 here. a plus i delta x. Delta x, we just found it. It's 4 over n. Simplify, I get 4i over n. That's si. Next, find f of si. f of si means we plug si into the function. Plug si into the function for each x. So I get 4i over n cube minus 3 times x. x is 4i over n. We plug si into the function. Plug si into the function. Then simplify. I get 64i cube over n cube minus 12i over n. 
That's f of si. Next, plug everything into the formula. The integral from 0 to 4. s cubed minus 3x dx equal to the limit as n approaches to infinity sigma i from 1 to n f of s i is this 64 i cubed over n cubed minus 12 i over n times delta x delta x is 4 over n Leave it the way it is. Simplify this sigma notation first. Here I distribute 4 over m first. If I distribute 4 over m, I get 256 i cube over n to the power of 4 minus 48i over n squared. Then, if there are two terms inside a sigma, according to this property here, we know that if there are two terms inside a sigma, I can split it into two sigmas. So, split it into two sigmas. I get sigma i from 1 to n of 256i cubed over n to the power of 4 minus sigma i from 1 to n of 48i over n square. Next, for each sigma, we consider i as a variable. Everything other than i is considered as, as a constant. So here I can pull out 256, pull out n to the power of 4. In the second, in the second, second sigma, I can pull out 48, pull out n square. So what we have here is 256 over n to the power of 4 times sigma i from 1 to n of i cube minus 48 over n square times sigma i from 1 to n of i then use the formula 256 over n to the power of 4 times I try to rewrite this expression, this sigma notation without sigma sigma i from 1 to n of, n of i cube is n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4 n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4 minus 48 over n squared times sigma i from 1 to n of i and we know that sigma i from 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 over 2 that's n times n plus 1 over 2 simplify I can divide top and the bottom by 4 I get 64 here and then divide top and the bottom Cancel x square, cancel n square from top and the bottom. What's left on the bottom is n square. On the top, this n square can cancel. What's left is 64 times n plus 1 square. For the second part here, I can cancel 2 from top and the bottom. And cancel 1 of the n's from top and the bottom. What's left is 24 times n plus 1 over n. Then In the first part, I can write 64 on the side. n plus 1 square and n square, they both contain square. I can pull out square. Write n plus 1 over n. In the second part, I can put 24 on the side. What's left is n plus 1 over n. Next, let me continue from here. limit n goes to infinity 
64 times here in the parentheses. n divided by n is 1. 1 divided by n stays the same. Square. I've got square here. It should be a square. Minus 24 times n divided by n is 1 plus 1 over n. Then take limit. Take limit. As n goes to infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. 1 over infinity is 0. So I get 64 times 1 plus 0 squared minus 24 times 1 plus 0. And we know that 64 times 1 is 64. 24 times 1 is 24. I get 64 minus 24. 64 minus 24 is 20. That's the answer to part A. Part B. Do the same thing. We first of all compute delta x. Delta x is always b minus a over n. In the integral here, that's a, that's b. So it's that's a, that's b. I have 9 minus 3 over n. We know that 9 minus 3 is 6. I get 6 over n. That's delta x. Next, compute si. Si is always a plus i dot x. Si is always a plus i dot x. Here, a is 3. Let's be a is 3. So I get 3 plus i times dot x. Dot x here is 6 over n. If I simplify, I get 3 plus 6i over n. That's si. Next, find f of si. si is 3 plus 6i over n. For f of 3 plus 6i over n, that means I plug, I plug 3 plus 6i over n into the function for x. Plugging 3 plus 6i over n for each x. If I plug in, I have 3 plus 6i over n squared minus 2 times 3 plus 6i over n. Plug this expression for each x. Then simplify. In the first part, expand the perfect square, I get 9 plus 36 i over n plus 36 i square over n square. That's in the first part, expand the perfect square. Second part, distribute negative 2. I get negative 6 minus 12 i over n. Then combine like terms. 9 minus 6 is 3. 36 i over n minus 12 i over n. That's 24 i over n. Plus 36 i squared over n squared. That's f of si. Then plug everything into the formula here. Let me write everything over. The integral from 3 to 9 x squared minus 2x dx equal to the limit as n approaches to infinity sigma i from 1 to n times f of x times f of si f of si is this we just found it f of si f of, f of si is 3 plus 24i over n plus 36i squared over n squared times times delta x don't forget times delta x delta x here is 6 over n 
then simplify. I can distribute 6 over n first. Distribute 6 over n. I get 18 over n plus 144i over n squared plus 216i squared over n cubed. Distribute 6 over n into the parentheses. Then, if there are three terms in the parentheses, I can split the sigma into three sigmas by the first property here. When there are two terms inside a sigma notation, I can split it into two sigmas. So same thing works for three terms. If there are three terms inside, inside sigma, I can split it into three sigmas. So I get limit as n approaches to infinity, sigma i from 1 to n of 18 over n plus the second sigma i from 1 to n of 144i over n squared plus the third sigma i from 1 to n of 216i squared over n cubed. Then here we consider i as a variable. Everything other than i is a constant, I can put it outside. So here I can pull out 18 pull out n. If I pull out 18 over n, there's nothing left. I must write 1 here. I cannot leave a blank. I must, I must put 1 here. This number 1 here is a placeholder. I cannot leave a blank. This 1 here is a placeholder. Next, for the second sigma, I can pull out 144. Pull out n squared and leave i layer. Pull out 144 over n squared. I get sigma i from 1 to n of i. For the third sigma, I can pull out 216, pull out n cubed, and leave i squared layer. Then use the formulas. Anything over n stays the same. Sigma i from 1 to n of, of 1. This is n. Plus 144 over n squared times sigma i from 1 to n of i. Sigma i from 1 to n of i is n times n plus 1 over 2. So that's n times n plus 1 over 2. Plus, next term, I leave 216 over n cubed, the same. Sigma i from 1 to n of i squared. Sigma i from 1 to n of i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Then simplify. In the first term, I can cancel n. What's the difference? 18. In the second term here, 144 divided by 2 is 72. I can cancel 1 of the n. What's the difference? n plus 1 on the top over n on the bottom. In the third term, 216 divided by 6 is 36 on the top. I can cancel 1 of the n from top to the bottom. What's left on the top is n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. What's, on, what's left on the bottom is n squared. Next, let's keep going. Simplify. 18 stays the same. In the second part, I can write 72 in the front. What's left is n plus 1 over n. Write 72 in the front. What's left is n plus 1 over n. Next turn, I can put 36 in the front. On the top, I have n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. 
on the bottom I have n square. I can put one n here, another n here. And then simplify. I get 18 plus 72 times. Here, n divided by n is 1, plus 1 divided by n. Next, plus 36 times. n divided by n is 1, plus 1 over n is 1 over n. Next, 2n divided by n is 2, plus 1 over n. 1 over n is 1 over n. And then, take limit. As n approaches infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. 1 over infinity is 0. 1 over infinity is 0. What's left is 18 plus 72 times 1 plus 0 plus 36 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 0. We know that 72 times 1 is 72. 36 times 1 times 2 is 72. 18 plus 72 plus 72 is 162.